21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what do you mean he's missing? Missing from where? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how long ago did he leave? Uh-huh. How much money? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I understand. Now, just hold the phone. I want to connect you with the detectives. Yeah. Just hold on. That's right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. After I went through the customary routine of turning out the platoon, reading reports and communications, and inspecting the cells and other parts of the station house, I went out on patrol of the precinct in sector car number three. At 10.30 a.m., I returned to the station house to keep an appointment with the owner of one of the many nightclubs in the precinct, who asked to see me in regard to the application of several of his new employees for cabaret worker permits which are under the jurisdiction of the police department. After he left, I went into the back room and up the rickety stairs past the 21st detective squad on the second floor to the third floor where the precinct youth patrolman, the safety officer, the civil defense patrolman, and the precinct hack inspector each have their offices. As I walked down the narrow hallway, I could see inside the open door of the hack inspector's office. Patrolman Jaffe sat behind his desk, and a man wearing a baseball cap and a washed-out sports shirt stood in front of him. And how long after that was it before you noticed the briefcase in the back of your cab? Captain? Hello, Jaffe. Well, I took the car around the corner, and this lady flags me, and she gets in. When I turn around to listen where she wants to go, I see the briefcase. Listen, what do you want from me? I brought it into the station house tonight. You're supposed to thoroughly search the interior of the cab after discharging each passenger. There was trucks double parked and a line in back of me when he got out. How could I hold up traffic? I ought to send you down to the hack bureau on a violation. For what? For being honest? For not looking in the back of the cab as soon as possible. I told you. Uh, Jaffe. Yes, sir, Cub. I want you to call down to the license bureau and check on these for me. Yes, sir. The owner of the cabaret was just in my office. He's got these new people working for him, and he hasn't heard. Yes, sir. I'll get right on it. Could I go now? I'm only losing time. Yeah, you can go. But look in the back of your cab, will you? I will. Don't worry about that. Oh, Jaffe, if the desk officer calls, I'll be in the detective squad. Yes, sir. Being honest, you're getting a jam. Huh? You've got to be honest faster. Listen, I came in at the first station house I passed at the first opportunity. I brought the briefcase right in and gave it to the lieutenant down there. The lieutenant gave me a hard time for being honest. He just wants you to stay honest. Well, so long. Whole deal over nothing. Over a briefcase. Is uh, Lieutenant King in his office? Oh, yes, sir, Captain. He's in there. Yes. Captain Kennelly. Hello, Matt. Captain. You busy, Matt? No, sit down, Captain. I was just going over the telephone record of the squad. Those guys are supposed to enter every outside call they make. Well, we batted a great percentage last month. There's entries for about half the calls. Well, I guess what you need, Matt, is bookkeepers, not detectives. Yes, sir, I guess so. What can I do for you, Captain? Hold on to your chair, Matt. Oh, what's up? The second and third floors are going to get a coat of paint. Well, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. They'll be here at 8 o'clock next Monday morning. Oh, I didn't think I'd live to see the day. Everything? Walls? Woodwork? Everything. What about the muster room and your office? Well, they say that can wait until next year. Did they take a good look at it? <laughs> it can still wait. Yes. Excuse me, Lieutenant. Yeah, Cassidy. Lieutenant Lawrence K. of the 112th Squad is on the straight line, Lieutenant. All right, thanks. Yes, sir. Well, Matt, Wait I... just a second, Captain, if you have time. Yeah, sure, okay. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Hello, Matt. Larry, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, listen, Matt. Yeah? A uh, guy walked in the house out here and says he's office manager of the Sunning Hill Linen Service at 764 East 80th Street. Yeah. Lester Mappin, M-A-P-P-I-N. 
He said he went to the bank of the Hudson Trust Company, Lexington Avenue branch, to get his company's payroll. Yeah? He says two men forced him into a car just outside the bank, brought him out here, and dumped him on Queens Boulevard. How much was it? $3,129.60. You got a description of the man in the car? We're just starting to talk to him, Matt. He just this minute came upstairs. The desk officer sent him up. Sounds like a straight story, though. He said all they took was the cash. They left the bank book and duplicate deposit slip with them. So they didn't want that. The slip shows a deposit of about a dozen checks. There's a time stamp on it. 10.38 a.m. Okay, Larry. I'll send a couple of men out there to get them. If you get anything that looks like it could be a line before they get out there, would you get back to me here? Yeah, sure will, man. All right, thanks. I'll mention it. What is it, man? Payroll stick up, Captain. Yeah? Two men grabbed the office manager of a linen service as he was coming out of the Lexington Avenue branch of the Hudson Trust Company. They rode out to Forest Hills and took $3,000 off him. Cassidy. Yes, sir? Come in here. Yes, sir. Any descriptions of the car or the men? Just starting to talk to them out there. Oh. Yes, sir, Lieutenant? What are you working on? Well, nothing much until just now, Lieutenant. What happened just now? I took a call from the Sunning Hill Linen Service, 764 East 80th Street. Yeah? Their office manager left for the bank over an hour ago to get a $3,000 payroll. He hasn't shown up yet, so they're getting a little bit worried. Well, they got a right to be worried. They got him out at the 112th squad. He was stuck up by two men coming out of the bank. They loaded him into a car and drove him out and dumped him in Forest Hills. Oh, yeah? Call him back over there at the Linen Service. Tell him what happened. Yes, sir. Who's out there with you? Novak, sir. Take Novak and ride on out to the 112th. Get this guy, all right? Yes, sir. All right, get going. Novak. Oh, looked for a while like it was going to be a quiet day, Captain. You uh, hadn't counted on it, had you? No, sir, but I had my hopes up. Detectives Cassidy and Novak left immediately for the 112th precinct in Queens, where the man who had reported he had been robbed of a $3,129 payroll was being interviewed. Before I went downstairs to the muster room, Lieutenant K, the commander of the 112th detective squad, again telephoned Lieutenant King, the commander of the 21st squad. Lieutenant K's detectives had obtained more details from the victim and a description of the two men he said robbed him. He also gave a description of the car, but was unable to furnish a registration number. At noon, sector car number four came by the house for me, and I again went on patrol of the precinct. During the course of the patrol, we rode up Lexington Avenue, and as we approached the branch of the Hudson Trust Company, I saw the patrolman on post, patrolman Charles Lasky, on the sidewalk. I instructed patrolman Mercado, the operator of the car, to pull over to the curb. All right. Wait here, Mercado. Lasky? Yes, sir, Captain. Hello. Well, where were you? Where was I when, Captain? When those two stuck the gun on the fellow coming out of the bank and took a $3,000 payroll from him. Today? About 1040. Today? Not last night. Well, this is the first I've heard of it, Captain. What's your ringing time? 39. What happened? Well, the office manager of a linen service got a $3,000 payroll out of the bank. Came out here on the sidewalk. Two men accosted him, forced him into a car, and drove him out to Forest Hills. Didn't you hear about it? Well, I rang in at 11.40. The sergeant didn't tell me anything. Well, I don't think he knew about it then. No, it's been awful quiet on the post, Captain. Did you ring in on time at 10.39? Yes, sir, right on time. Where'd you ring from? Well, the call box right here in the corner. Well, how long were you on the corner? Didn't you see anything? No, sir, I... Didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Didn't you see two men walk up to another one on the street? One that was coming out of the bank? No, sir. You're sure? Captain, I, I would have noticed something like that if that happened. You're positive you were on the corner here at 10.39? Yes, sir. I was ringing in. Well, what length of time did you talk to the sergeant? Well, for a couple of minutes, Captain. He was giving out an alarm on a lost child. Then where did you go? Well, if I remember correctly, I stayed right here on the corner for a while and... Oh, yeah, there was a car parked in the no-standing zone here, so I, I wrote out a summons to hang on it. Right here on the corner? Yes, sir, it was parked right here. Let's see the summons, stub. You have it in your book? Yes, sir. Let me see. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, the car was parked right here. I, I wrote out the summons at uh, 10.43. Uh-huh. In other words, you were on this corner for at least five minutes. At least five minutes, Captain. The uh, car you wrote out the summons for, it wasn't a black Plymouth two-door, was it? No, sir, it was a convertible. Did you see the driver? Uh, a Chevy convertible, green. Yes, sir, I saw the driver when she came out. She'd been in the drugstore for a while, and when she came out, I was still writing the summons. Were there any other cars parked between here and the bank at that time? No, sir, there weren't. 
You're sure? Well, if there were, Captain, they, they would have gotten a summons. Come on over to the call box a minute. Yes, sir. No, I didn't see anything going on here, Captain. If anything was going on at that time, I would have seen it. Yeah. Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain Kennelly on box 14. Yes, sir, Captain. Sergeant, uh, look on your telephone record and tell me what was the last time Lasky rang in. Yes, sir. 11.40, Captain. Ah, and the time before that? 10.39, Captain. From box 14? Yes, sir. From box 14, both times. Sergeant, connect me with Lieutenant King, will you? Yes, sir. Hold on, Captain. First squad, Lieutenant King. This is Captain Kennelly, Matt. Yes, sir. Matt, uh, did that hold-up victim tell the detectives out at the 112th that the two men accosted him as soon as he came out of the bank? Yes, sir. They held a gun on him, took him across the sidewalk to the curb? Yes, sir, that's right. Said they had their car parked there right at the curb. Down at the corner from the bank? Yes, sir, that's right, down at the corner. Uh, Matt, I'm over on that corner now. Yes, sir. Lasky on post here was on this corner from the time of the robbery and for at least five minutes afterwards. He didn't see anything like that happen. Well, he might have missed it, Captain. The guy said it happened awful fast. They got him in the car in a hurry. Oh, that's the point, Matt. Lasky says there was only one car parked here. It's a no-standing zone. He gave the one car parked here a summons, and it wasn't the getaway car. It was a green convertible. Is he sure he was there during the time of the robbery? Well, the man's deposit slip was stamped 1038 in the bank. Isn't that right? Yes, sir, that's right. 1038. Well, Lasky rang in from this call box here at 1039. Oh, did he? Yes, and he was standing here writing out the summons after that. The time on the summons is 1043. That puts a little bit different light on things, Captain. Yeah, I think it does. Did they get back from Forest Hills with the victim yet? No, sir, but they left there. I expect them back any minute. Well, I'm kind of interested to hear a little bit more about this robbery, man. So am I, Captain was such a thing. All right. I'll be in in a little while. Yes, sir. Captain, if those stick-up men parked that car there, I'd have seen it. I'd have tagged it. I don't think there was a car. If there wasn't a car, Lasky, there wasn't a stick-up. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You hear your confession repeated over and over again drummed into your head. They make you memorize it, sign it, and by torture and drugs, they finally get you so you yourself believe it. Then, finally, they put you on the witness stand, and you hear a voice admitting the guilt. You don't even care anymore. You hardly realize that it's your own voice, repeating the words they want you to say. Yes, that has happened in some countries, but there's a very good reason why it couldn't happen to you. Fifteen words in our Bill of Rights are your protection. They say very clearly, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. When we read about the rigged trials, the phony witnesses, the drugged confessions that take place in certain countries today, we're pretty glad that our Constitution was written by men of foresight. Well, maybe they couldn't look ahead to our day, but they were determined to protect us against such things happening in this country. For ourselves, for generations to come, this right exists, assuring us of fair trials, due process of law, and no one can compel us to be a witness against ourselves. It's right there in black and white, in words that have been unaltered for 165 years. It is one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. When I got back into the car, I instructed Patrolman Mercado to return to the station house. He made a right turn at the next corner and came downtown on 3rd Avenue. I got out of the car and told him to pick up his partner and resume patrol. Then I crossed the sidewalk, walked up the stone steps into the muster room where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, Captain. Yes, Sergeant. All right, 17. Division called. Inspector McBride wants to talk to you. All right. As soon as I sign the blotter. Yes, sir. What's doing, Ray? 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what's the trouble, lady? Yeah. 
Yeah. Heavy smoke is coming out of the smokestack? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You call the Department of Air Pollution Control. Air Pollution Control. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Worth 40495. Worth. W O. Well, I agree with you. Something ought to be done about that. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. Don't mention it. Uh, what time did Inspector McBride call, Sergeant? Oh, it was uh, 12.14, Captain. Oh. I told him you were out on patrol. I asked him if he wanted you to get a radio call put out for you. He said no, just have you call him when you got back into the house. All right. Oh, and there's a couple of other messages. I left them on your desk. Okay. Can we go straight on through the back there, Mr. Mappin. Hello, Cassidy. Oh, Captain. Uh, Mr. Mappin, this is uh, Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the precinct. How do you do, Mr. Mappin? Well, it's too bad what happened to you. Yes, and in broad daylight, right on the street, in broad daylight. Oh, Cassidy, will you tell Lieutenant King I'm back in the house? Yes, sir. And uh, that I'll be upstairs in a little while. Yes, sir. All right, right back that way, Mr. Mappin. Yeah, you just can't tell. You just can't tell about what? You just can't tell what's going to happen to you in broad daylight. Yeah. Well, lots of things can happen. Upstairs. Yeah. How did they know I was going to be in the bank and when I was going? Oh, they have ways of finding those things out. In broad daylight? Yeah, well, it has to be in broad daylight. The bank isn't open at night. It's right over that way. Uh, who is it I'm going to see? Lieutenant King. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. Right. right back there to that little office. I'd like to get a chance to call my office. Oh, you will, Mr. Mappin. I'd like to let them know where I am. You can call them. Yes. Cassidy, Lieutenant. Come in. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Lieutenant King, this is Mr. Mappin. Why are you, Mr. Mappin? Well, considering everything all right, I guess. Sit down, please. Thank you. Where's Novak, Cassidy? He's parking the car, Lieutenant. Okay. Well, that was some experience you had, Mr. Mappin. Yes, it was. I, I'd really like to call my office and let them know where I am. All right. Use this phone. Thank you. Hello? This is Mr. Mappin. Yes, yes, I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. No, no, they didn't hurt me. Could I talk to Mr. Douglas, please? Thank you. Did you bring back a description of the man in the car, Cassidy? Oh, yes, sir. Here's a copy of the 61 they took from him. Here's the bank book and the deposit slip. They gave that back to him. Uh-huh. Hello, Mr. Douglas. No, I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. They didn't touch me. All they wanted was the money, I guess. No, no, no I'm not worried. I'm all right. I, I called to tell you I'm back in New York. I'm at the 21st squad, 21st detective squad. That's on the second floor of the precinct house. Yeah, yes, that's right, sir. That's, that's right, Mr. Douglas. I'll ask him. Excuse me, Lieutenant. Mr. Douglas wants to know if you'd like him to come over here. No, that's not necessary right now. We'll want to talk to him, but we'll let him know when. There'll probably be someone over there to see him. Mr. Douglas, the Lieutenant says it's not necessary for you to come over. He says they'll send somebody over to see you. All right, sir. Y yes, sir. Yes, sir, I will, Mr. Douglas. Goodbye. Yes, sir. That's my boss. He's really being very nice about the whole thing. Well, he's insured, isn't he? Oh, yes, of course he's insured. Now, Mr. Mappin. Yes, sir. I'd like to get the whole story of this from beginning to end. Is that all right with you? Well, I told it to the detectives out there, and I told it again to your two detectives when they came. Well, you really ought to get used to telling it, because you'll be telling it a lot more times. Yes, I suppose I will. First of all, where do you live? I live at 22 West 80th Street. Manhattan? Yes, sir, in Manhattan. How old are you? I'm 34. How long have you been working for the Sunning Hill Linen Service? A little over five years. You always been employed there in your present position? No, I was one of the cashiers when I first came. I was promoted about two and a half years ago. Just what does that mean, office manager? Well, I'm in charge of the entire office, all the girls, stenographers, and the clerks, and the cashiers, everybody who works in the office. I see. Will you tell us what the routine is about the payroll? Well, what do you mean, routine? I mean, just how is it made up and who gets it, and everything about the payroll itself. Oh, well, of course, it's not our complete payroll, you know. The office help is paid by check, and the drivers and the workers in the laundry get paid in cash. They get paid every week, and we get paid every two weeks, uh, the office help. Well, why is that? Well, I haven't any idea. It's just a system the accountant introduced several years ago. Must be some reason for it. Yes, I suppose there is. Now, payday is today, naturally. Naturally. Well, uh, about 9.30 this morning, I phoned to the bank and told them exactly how I wanted the payroll made up. Uh, that is, I told them the payroll would be $3,129.60. I told them how many fives, how many tens, how many ones, and so forth uh, that I would want. So they'd have it ready when you got there? Yes, that's right. In a package. You took a deposit to the bank also? 
Oh, yes, checks that had come in. There's no sense making two trips when you can make one. Well, why isn't the payroll made up from the cash that the drivers bring in? It's mostly a cash business, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is, but the money the drivers bring in comes late in the afternoon, and we take it over and put it in the bank in the night depository. Mr. Douglas doesn't like to leave all that cash around the office overnight. He says the safes are not very safe. The ones that we have, that is. He thinks it's wise to put it in the night depository. Oh, so do we. Uh, you went to the bank. Yes, I went to the bank, and first I made my little deposit. It was just 10 or 12 checks from some of the accounts that had come in. I gave the teller the payroll check, and he gave me the package containing the payroll. That was at 10.38 a.m.? Oh, it was around there. I don't know exactly what time. Well, here's a deposit slip from the bank. You can see where it has the time stamped right on it. Oh, yes. I never noticed before they put the time on it. They do, yes. Uh, you left the teller's window with a package of money. Yes. $3,129.60. I headed out the front door to Lexington Avenue, just the way I do every week. When I got on the sidewalk, I turned to go back to the office. You're going to walk back? Yes. It's quite a pleasant day. I thought I would. And then I, I felt myself being shoved up against the wall, and these two men were there. One of them had his hand in his pocket, and I was sure it was a gun. It must have been a gun. It could have been anything else. And they told me to go over to the curb and get into the car, and I did. You just did? Well, there's nothing wrong in that, is there? There's nothing wrong in not wanting to get hurt. I mean, after all, it's only money. You can't take a chance of getting hurt just to save the money, especially if it's insured. Especially, yes. Yeah. What happened after they put you in the car? Well, they told me to look down at the floor and not to look at either of their faces. They said they wouldn't hurt me if I didn't make them any trouble. And as I said, it's only money, and I decided not to make them any trouble. I looked down at the floor, and I kept looking down at the floor. They told me they were going to take me someplace and let me out. And they took you out to Forest Hills? That's right. I knew we went across the bridge, and we were driving out Queens Boulevard. I don't know where exactly they were taking me, but they were very nice about the whole thing. They laughed. They gave me back the bank book and the deposit slip, as you can see. They said they had no use for that, and they knew how much trouble it would cause me if they took it and if it was destroyed. They were very considerate about that. Did you ever see their gun or guns? No, as a matter of fact, but I, I knew they had them. They must have had them. What made you so sure? Well, the one of them, the one who wasn't driving, he kept his hand in his pocket all the time, you know, in his coat pocket. He said he had a gun, and I couldn't do anything but believe him. You don't blame me for not taking a chance, do you? No, no, we don't blame you. After all, it was only money. Yeah, that's all it was, only money. They drove you out Queens Boulevard. Yes, that's right. And they got to 75th Road. They pulled the car into the curb. And the one that wasn't driving, he opened up and he got out and they told me to go down the subway. Go down there and don't look around. He said a friend of his was standing on the sidewalk there and would follow me downstairs and see that I didn't turn around or talk to anybody, use the phone, anything like that. Well, I, I couldn't do anything else but believe him. And I was glad to get out of the car. Mm, guess you were. Yes, sir. I agreed to do exactly what they said, so I went downstairs in the subway. I guess that car just pulled right away. I didn't see anybody around there and I walked a few steps toward the train. Then I decided that that was just a story about having somebody follow me downstairs in the subway. So I got back up on the street. I looked around. The car was gone. And I, I saw a cop standing over there on a the corner. So I just walked over to him and told him what happened. That's all there is to it. Yes. Captain Kennelly. Come in, Captain. Hello, Matt. Captain. Hello, Mr. Mappin. Captain. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to get straight, Mr. Mappin. Oh, yeah, sure. Anything you want to know, I'd be glad to tell you. I I don't think I skipped anything. Well, there's a few things I'd just like to make sure about. Sure, anything you want. Uh, but listen, could I get some lunch, do you think? Any way I could send out for a sandwich? Yes, we'll get a sandwich for you. Yeah, I'd certainly appreciate it. I haven't had a thing to eat since breakfast. It's getting pretty late. As soon as we get through here, it won't take long. Well, all right, if it won't take long. Uh, you were in the bank at 10.38 a.m. If that's the time it says on the deposit slip, I guess that's what I must have been in there. I, I told you it was right around that time. Yes, you told us. Then you came right outside, started to walk back to your office. That's right. When you got out on the sidewalk, you were accosted by these two men. Yes. They told you to walk to the curb right there in front of the bank. Well, almost in front of the bank. Down closer to the corner a little bit, I think. Between the bank and the corner. Are you fam familiar with it? The bank isn't exactly on the corner. There's a couple of stores between the corner and the bank, Captain. Yes, I, uh, I know the spot. They forced you to get into a car which was parked at the curb. That's right. Now, you told the detectives it was, uh, let's see, a 1952 Plymouth two-door. That's right. That's what I think it was. It could have been a 51, but I think it was a 52. Oh. Now, what did you do with the money? Well, uh, they took it away from me almost as soon as I got in the car. They took the package just like it was given to me at the bank. I don't mean about the two men. I mean, what did you do with it? I, I told you, I gave it to them, those two men. Now, how could you give it to them if there weren't any two men? There wasn't any car... Oh, wait a minute. Mr. Mappin, there was a police officer standing on that corner at the very time you came out of the bank. 
Well, that could have been. In the space you described, there's no parking allowed. The officer was writing out a summons for a green Chevrolet convertible that had been parked there in violation of the law. No other car was parked there at that time. Now, what'd you do with the money? I, I was held up. They took it away from me. Where is it? I told you that the two men took it away from me. They held me up on the street and made me get in the car. Captain, could we get Patrolman Lasky in here and have him describe the conditions on the street at that very time? We sure can. How soon do you want him, Matt? Let's get him in here as soon as possible. We'll have to take a ride out to Forest Hills and go to his sister's house. My sister's house? Yes, that's right. If you won't tell us where the money is, we'll find it. Well, what are you going to do at my sister's house? Find the money. It's not there. I don't have it. But you were there this morning, weren't you? No. Now, why would your sister lie to me? I made a telephone call to the house. She answered the phone. I asked for you. I told her I was a friend of yours. She said you weren't there, but you had been there this morning. You came to visit her, and you left. How about it, Lester? Well, nothing about it. I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Look, I knew you picked Forest Hills for some reason. While you were on the way back here, I called some people at your office, asked them who your relatives were. They told me you had a sister in Forest Hills. Is the money there, Lester? It is there, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's there. I didn't even unwrap it. I didn't even take it out of the package. It's there. Now, why did you want to steal it from your boss? I didn't want to. I, I just... I, I had to. I just had to. You believe me, Captain? I just had to. What do you mean, you had to? I just did. Well, what were you going to do with the money? I needed it. I... I wanted to go to Europe. Everybody was going to Europe. I wanted to go to Europe. I, I wanted to take a trip. Well, Lester, I don't think you'll get to Europe, but I do guarantee you a trip. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. What kind of accident? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is anyone hurt? Do you need an ambulance there? Now, who was hurt? Passengers of the bus or passengers of the car? Did the sergeant's car arrive on the scene yet? Yeah. Well, what are the traffic conditions there now? Yeah. All right. I'll notify the communications bureau to send an ambulance. Yeah. Are you placing the driver of the automobile under arrest? Okay. All right. Yeah. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or... The brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Harold Stone, Santos Ortega, Frank Marth, John Larkin, George Petrie, and John Sylvester. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Music.